Let's everybody stand together. This is the Lord's house. This is a good day. This is the Lord's day. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And the thing that makes me rejoice is this. God loves me, not because I'm good, but because he is. We welcome everybody watching us online, uh, those in the other buildings on campus that are watching us, Lake Park and Wilmington, and you. Thank you for coming to God's house today. I believe that God ordains everything. I believe he brought you here today to hear this message. And so I ask you now, again, Father, that you let me speak as an oracle of God, a representative, an ambassador. I pray that what comes out of this mortal mouth will touch hearts, minds, and change lives. Lord, your people came in today in various conditions. Some are really tired and some discouraged and some weary. Some have seen a little glimmer of light this week and things are looking up a bit. But we're all human. And you reminded me this morning, you saved us from sin, but you did not save us from being human. And all of the emotions and feelings that beset us, the same ones that attacked us when we were lost now work against us as we are saved. Lord, thank you for putting your spirit in us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you, O oh Lord, that these times are not greater than our God. So thank you now for what you will do for eternity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Smile at somebody on the way down. <clears throat> I have to uh, begin with a disclaimer. You know, we have two morning services. I've already preached this once. They sang it once. I had certain emotions at the first service. I was really moved by other things. Um, I'm not trying to duplicate that, those emotions or, you know, uh, I, I just want to be what the Lord wants me to be this morning. So if I get emotional at the same spot I did this morning at 8.30, that's not, I'm not playing. God really has touched my heart. I also said, and I'm, I'm, I'm here to inform everybody, I'm different. I know it's a shock. I, uh, on, on the scale, I would be considered weird. There's another shocker. But Sandra loves me. And my children. <laughs> so, as, as a pastor... You know, I, I read differently. I read the Bible differently. I'm always looking for something that's just odd. Because every word in God's word was put there for a purpose. And I, I like all the broad scriptures that everybody knows, but I like those tidbits and those nuggets that most people just pass over. And so I found one this week. I didn't realize it would be the message today. I was just skimming through Scripture. I do that a lot, you know. Just, and I came to 1 Corinthians, and I landed in chapter 7, where Paul is giving uh, uh, lots of 
practical advice about life. Um, and in this particular place, he's speaking to the unmarried and widows. And I saw something I've never seen before, so here it goes. I suppose, therefore, that this is good because of the present distress, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Now, that is not an exciting scripture, but it's full. So here's what Paul is saying. He said, I'm here. You've asked me questions. I am writing to answer those questions. You have asked me about marriage and widows and uh, things as such, things that concern Christians in this world now, things that have to be dealt with in the present distress. I'm giving you advice about these things knowing that we're all under pressure. I'm giving you the best I know of. I, I'm giving you what I believe God gave me to give you. But remember, all of this is being said in the present distress. Wow. One translation says, in the pressures of life. Paul talked a great deal about sufferings. For I... Declare that the sufferings of this present life are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us on that day. So Paul recognized that the church is in enemy territory. There is nothing in favor of the church outside of our fellowship. We're in darkness and blackness and in, they are in opposition to the truth of which we have been born. And so Paul is telling the church people, you're, you're having to deal with human things in a spiritual way in great distress. In Romans chapter 8, some would consider that the the golden passage in the Bible where Paul talks about having been predestined and chosen and called. And, but in the same chapter, he also says, we believers are groaning. We may be rejoicing. We may have been rejoicing this morning, but there's an underlying groan. There's a low-grade hunger. There's a dissatisfaction with wherever we are. God's people are groaning. The creation is groaning. No matter how beautiful, how good it gets, there's still that thing that says we're not home yet. This is not my home. They are not my people. I want to see Jesus. He said the believers grown to be delivered from sin and suffering. Yeah, sin and suffering. Read it for yourself. Oh, how we long for the day when we are in his presence and there's no more suffering for any reason whatsoever and no more fighting sin, no more temptations, no more falling and failing, stumbling that thing that stays on the inside of us all the time, that enemy of our soul, even ourselves. God saved us, as I prayed, from sin, but he did not save us from ourselves. We got to wrestle with it every day. We got to stay on our knees. We got to stay in the book. We have to fight the good fight of faith. So according to the scripture, we just live in distressful times. In this present distress, I'm trying to serve Jesus. There's an outward distress. I don't want to go into all the... I, I could list everything that's wrong in the world. You know it. The world's coming undone. Everything is coming unraveled. Everything that makes sense no longer makes sense. The ridiculous is lauded. Sin is praised. 
Folks, I don't know this world anymore. Everything is backwards. Jesus said in the last days there would be distress of nations. When men are looking at the things that are going on, their hearts will fail them for fear, for looking after the things that will come on this world. And we all know that Satan is loose. This is not common knowledge to the unbeliever. They're blinded. Satan has blinded their eyes. Their minds cannot grasp it. But we know, we know why there is a present distress. Because there is a devil. Now, he may be on God's leash. And God may have him limited. He can only go so far. But as time progresses and as people rebel against truth and reject it, God is lengthening the leash. And Satan is accruing more and more authority and affecting more and more things. The devil is loose. His demons have been assigned to our families, to our churches, to our hearts and our minds. I stand here today as a pastor and I tell you that every week, every day, I get bad news and it's about somebody being affected, some family being torn up, some tragedy taking place, some family, another family split up. For whatever reason, I hear it all the time. You cannot convince me that the devil is not desperate and that he's not trying to tear up my life, my family, so he can tear up my church. I know a lot of people say, we need to pray for the nation. It does no good to pray for the nation if the families are being torn apart. I refuse to pray for a government, a democracy. I refuse to pray for buildings and people sitting in buildings making laws. My heart is for every family in this church to be saved and spirit-filled and for the churches everywhere to see a revival of the family, a healing of the family. But Satan is going to stop it with all the force he can muster and all that God will allow him to have. That's exactly what he's going to do. Everywhere you go, there's outward distress. But there's an inward distress that takes place as well. I read these verses often when I get down. Yeah, down. I mean down. Like tomorrow, I'll be down. And Thursday, I'll be down. Why? Because I preached today and I taught on Wednesday. And it's just the way it is. And people give me advice all the time. Just rejoice. Just be happy. And I say, just get out of my face. I've been doing this longer than you've been alive. I know all the keys. I know what to expect. I've been through it all, up, down, in, and out. You can't tell me anything. You can't give me a scripture I haven't claimed and confessed and forgotten. It's life, folks. It's getting up every day and putting your shoes on and walking out into a world that hates righteousness. And because I am righteous, I am the object of Satan's tyranny and hatred. And this Here's what he said. This is the man that wrote Romans 8. This is the man that said the just shall live by faith. This is the man that said rejoice. And again I say rejoice. He said we don't want you to be ignorant brethren. Of our trouble which came to us in Asia. That we were burdened beyond measure. Above strength so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves. Here's the man of faith talking. He didn't say, oh, just ignore it. He said, nope, some things you can't ignore, and this is one of them. The trouble we were in caused us to be burdened beyond measure. You can't measure how heavy our hearts were. And this was beyond our strength. We were hopeless. We were helpless. We despaired even of life. We thought 
we were going to die. We thought it was over. We thought after all God has assigned us to do and all of the appointments he has sent us to, we thought for some reason it's over now. It's just done. We despaired even of life. And I've read this scripture so many times in my personal despair. He said, for indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest. But we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts, fightings. Inside were fears. Don't you let anybody put you down. Don't let anybody who is so uh, faith-minded, obsessed with faith, that they put you down because you happen to be in a struggle right now with yours, with your faith. Because even the great Paul, who would lose his head for the gospel, said, everywhere I went, I was tore up. That's how we say it in Anson County. I was tore up on the inside. My, my insides were coming out. My guts were coming out. And on the outside, everything was against us. Everybody was in our face. Everything seemed to contest us everywhere we go. And we all are familiar with that. But to me, the lowest blow, the, the blow below the belt, that Satan throws in our way is when he teams up with my natural man, with the old Loran, and they come against me, and I turn on myself. It's when I'm weary and burdened, and there's no way to measure the, the difficulties in my life. I, I, don't, I don't know what else to do, and then... I turn against me, I look in the mirror and say, what a hypocrite. You're not always honest in everything and you know it. You've looked at things you shouldn't have looked at and you know it and you call yourself a Christian and you purport to be a spiritual leader of some sort. Aren't, aren't you a joke? You don't even believe half the things you preach. But you got to keep it up, don't you? Because you got an image to protect. John wrote one time and said, Brothers, if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart. Let me explain that to you. There are times when your own heart condemns you. You don't have an ally except the Holy Spirit of God. Your own heart turns on you. Your own flesh fights against you. They team up. They ally with the enemy of your soul. And they beat you down and make you feel worthless and empty and hypocritical. Untrustworthy in everything you do. That's a low moment right there, my friend. This coming Tuesday, this coming Tuesday night, two weeks ago, at 2.30 a.m., I was asleep, and I sat straight up in bed, and I was sweating, and I was freezing, and I was burning up, and I was sick to my stomach. I, it's a kind of fear I can't describe. I wasn't sick either. I was not physically sick. I just sat up, and unbeknownst to me, the enemy of my soul had appointed this time to try one of his most vicious attacks. And when I sat up and began to wipe the perspiration and, and thought, my bed is soaking wet, what's wrong with me? A scripture came to my mind, Matthew 7, 21. Jesus said, and many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not perform many mighty works in your name? Did we not cast out devils in your name? 
And then I will say to them, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. And the sick fear was this. Am I one of those, Lord? Do you mean, after all this and all these years, 45 years in this church, is it possible that when I see you, you will say, I don't know you? Lord, I'm the one that has told the people all these years, I can't wait to see Jesus. When I look in his face and hear him say, well done. But what if he doesn't say, well done, and he says, I don't know you. I want to tell you something. That was a bad attack. That was a low blow. And when I, I honestly felt paralyzed, I, I, I couldn't draw a breath. But God brought another scripture to my mind. I sat there for a moment, and then I knew if I yelled, Sandra, it would wake Sandra up. So I thought, what can I do? Because there's something I want to yell. And I looked over and she wasn't there. She had already gone downstairs. She gets up every night and goes downstairs and prays and drinks coffee and whatever. Because we've had, we've had some trauma in our life in the last several years. The kind that breaks your spirit. kind where you feel there's no way out of this this will never be fixed in your mind that you're thinking this is impossible so she's up and I'm sitting on the bed and when I looked and saw that her place was empty I said Lord I believe That's all I can say. I believe. I believe you're God. I believe Jesus is Savior. I believe the Holy Spirit abides in me. I believe I'm saved. I believe when I see you, you will say, welcome home. I believe, I believe, I believe. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. And the Lord heard my cry and answered me and put me in a broad place and raised me up. The devil only gets one shot before the Lord says, get out of here. Touch my, do not touch my anointed one. Shut your hellish mouth. This one's bought, this one's paid for. This one's owned. This one belongs to me. This one's in heaven. Get away. Get thee hence, Satan. Then when he runs off, old Slewfoot, the Lord laid this scripture on my heart. Man, how many times have I taken fresh nourishment from this? So will you give me a moment this morning? All right. And when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. And immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd answered, and said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. He's got a demon. And the demon won't even let him talk. And wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out. But they could not. And he answered him and said, oh, faithless generation... 
How long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, does that not amaze you? Here's the man's son on the ground. He's frothing, he's wallowing, he's rigid, he can't talk. This is a pitiful sight. And instead of Jesus just jumping right in and fixing it, he said, now how long has he been this way? He said from childhood, God, I've been doing this a long time. I've seen this for many years. And often he has thrown him in both the fire and the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you can believe all things are possible to him who believes, immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Oh, friend, he was in distress. He's watching his child go through a horrible, horrible demonic convulsion, and there's nothing he can do about it. Let me say this. Listen to this preacher. This is a picture of sin, what sin does to people. Let me tell you parents who are weary with the situation in your family. This boy could not get to Jesus on his own. His daddy had to bring him to Jesus. The very children that are wrecking their lives, the ones you love most, the one you would do anything for, the very ones that told you to get out of their face, the ones that said, I don't want anything to do with you anymore, cannot get to Jesus so you keep taking them to Jesus. I don't care how many times you do it. God listens and God answers. Keep taking them to Jesus. There are times you get tired of praying the same old prayer. But God never gets tired of hearing you pray the same old prayer. So here he is, a mute spirit, can't even talk. Have you noticed how angry, sinful people can't even carry on a sane and civil conversation? They can't talk like normal people. And wherever it seizes him it, or grabs him, it just comes on him all of a sudden. It throws him down. About the time he thinks he's up here, Satan says, that's too high, and grabs him and throws him back down. And it's like you're taking two steps forward and three steps backward every time he seizes him and he throws him down and he foams at the mouth, meaning stuff is coming out of his mouth that's unnatural. He would never do that. They would never talk that way. Something behind them is making them speak this way. That's not natural. When they curse a parent, when they use foul language, when they blaspheme, you have to know that Satan is behind all of that activity. Satan has seized him, thrown him down. He's foaming at the mouth. He gnashes his teeth. He's angry, angry about everything, angry about family, angry about school, angry about relationships, angry about church, angry about finances, angry, and they just gnash their teeth. And that's exactly what Satan wants for them to seize up and be thrown down and speak foolish things and gnash their teeth at everybody in their life. How long has it been this way? Jesus wants you to tell him, how long has it been this way? You've got to have an honest conversation. Lord, it's been this way as long as I can remember. I saw the seeds years ago. And Lord, I know this, if it hadn't been for you, he would already be dead because Satan has often thrown him into the fire 
and in the water. One attempt after another. One dangerous situation after another. We think, how did they get out of that one? How did he live through that? It's Satan trying to kill, steal, and destroy. And the man said, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. You see, it's very possible for a believer to just get tired. I'm tired, you say. You've dealt with it, worked with it, prayed about it, suffered in it. A lot of times you've paid for it, invested in it, just trying to get some semblance of civility back into relationships, back into the home. You've given it all you've got. You've gone the extra mile. You've done all you know to do. And so you're just tired. Sometimes you're just afraid. You know, when a believer gets tired, fear comes quickly on the heels of that. And you start thinking, what if this happens? Can somebody say amen? amen? What if this happens? What if that doesn't happen? Oh my God, we think of the worst case scenarios all the time when we are weary in well-doing, in spiritual warfare, in this present distress, in the sufferings of this present life. We get tired, we get afraid, and then we get to the place that it's been going on so long we actually don't expect it to change. Maybe this is just the way it is. But I have something to say to you today. This is where the most important gift from God ever given to you comes in. What is it? Faith. Faith. God gave you the gift. To say, I'm so weak I can't lift a finger. I'm so tired I can't do anything else. I'm so scared I'm paralyzed. This looks like it's never going to change. But I trust Jesus. Faith. Faith is, is not an explanation for what's going on. You can't explain it. And faith is not knowledge of what's going on. And faith is not some power you build up by reading the Bible and memorizing Scripture. Faith is not some special force that can change situations. No, the gift of faith from God to you says, I'm tired, I'm afraid, I'm discouraged, I see no end but I trust Jesus. Jesus is greater than this problem. Jesus is greater than my weariness. Jesus is greater than my sin. Jesus is greater than my enemy. Jesus is greater than anything that comes my way. I trust Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. I just trust Jesus. I trust him. I can't explain him. I can't figure him out. I can't build myself up. I can't strengthen my own self. I can't deliver myself. I can't answer my own problems. I trust Jesus. Stand with me, please. Lord, I believe. But sometimes a little unbelief surges in. Now it's funny, Jesus didn't condemn this man. He says, if you can believe, all things are possible. The man said, I believe Jesus healed his son. But he realized that in this present distress, unbelief can slither in. You start looking at yourself rather than Christ. Start analyzing the situation rather than trusting the Lord. 
But this pastor came to tell you today, God heard you the first time you prayed. He heard you the first time you prayed. As I speak to you now, there is a war going on for the souls of your beloved. There is a, a fantastic contest, a vicious contest in the unseen world. The key for me is to say, I just trust Jesus. I trusted him enough to save me from sin. I trust him now to deliver my home, save my family. And he will. Did anybody hear the message today? Most of the time it gets worse before it gets better. I trust Jesus. A lot of times you just say, I'm done. But he never is. Hallelujah. He never is done. He's the lifter of my head. He's a shield about me. Thank God he doesn't reward me according to my goodness or my efforts. Thank God my prayers are not answered because I am faithful and good and righteous. They are answered because a weak, unfaithful, unrighteous man at times calls on a mighty, holy, everlasting, eternal, faithful God. So, Father, I thank you today. I do, I thank you today. In this present distress, you are already victor. I thank you in this present suffering. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. I thank you in this time of stress and pressure. You are our strength and our life. So God, we will not stop asking you to touch our sons, our daughters, our families, our churches. When we can't stand up, we will look up. When we have no voice left, we will bless you from within. Because you're God and God alone. And somehow, Lord, in, deep down in my heart, there's this little tiny whisper that says, and when he does it, it's going to be more than you imagined. And I praise you for it. Would you lift your hands with me? This is, this is what we do at this time in the service. We've heard the truth. We've heard the word. I want you to bless his name right now. Take two minutes and bless the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I can't, but you can. I couldn't, but you did. I wasn't, but you are. I'm weak, you're strong. I know nothing, you know everything. You are our life. Almighty, precious God. Dennis started out this morning asking you, has God been good to you? Folks, we've all had those in the middle of the night sensations, have we not? We've all been tempted to question our own salvation. We've all been there. But can I just make an observation? We're still here. We're still here, still praising, still nodding our heads, still loving good preaching and singing, still love to go to church. We're still here. Why? Because God is faithful. Yes, He is. God is faithful. I wonder if I could just call a mass choir here today, David, and sing that song. We'll join you. Bless the Lord.
everybody one time. exit this building you are not leaving alone you are leaving with the Holy Spirit abiding in you the Lord Jesus praying for you angels encamping around you you are leaving in good safe strong arms if Jesus doesn't come I'll see you Wednesday night we're going back to the tribulation that's Bible study but I hope he comes before then Would anybody be okay if Jesus were to come before then? Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Be blessed in everything you do.